My name is Lauren Schoenberg, and welcome to the Jazz Museum in Harlem. I'm the executive director on behalf of my, oh, thank you very much. On behalf of my co-director, Christian McBride, and my board of directors, I'd like to welcome everyone here tonight. First, a couple of uh, local notes about events that we're doing. I just want to get these out of the way, and I'll mention them again at the end. I see some people in the audience from our Jazz for Curious Listeners series, and I want to let you all know that next Tuesday, our film night, uh, is not going to be at the church because they really can't set a good film projector up in that room. So we're going to do it at the Museum of the City of New York, which is 104th and 5th. And we'll send you an email about it, and one of our volunteers will also call you and leave you a message. But next Tuesday night, again, we're going to be at the uh, M Museum of the City of New York at 7 o'clock. Uh, as I look around the audience this evening, I see what I love to see, which is a mixture of folks who we know, who we see all the time, and a healthy dose of new folks who came here tonight. And I'd like to welcome you to the Jazz Museum in Harlem family. The family really is uh, the full-time family, is myself and Wilhelmina Grant. You know Wilhelmina, uh, mother is, is uh, not feeling well, and she's taking care of her a lot these days, so she had to leave this evening. Uh, but she was here before you all know her, and we're pretty much the full-time staff, so we keep it spinning. We would be nowhere without our volunteers. I'd like you to acknowledge Loretta and Judy and some other folks here who come up and help all the time. And Anyway, this is a real family kind of thing that's happening here. I want to tell you something very important. I think I'm preaching to the choir here. You all know this, but I'm going to say it anyway, which is that Coleman Hawkins and Roy Eldridge were kings. They were kings in a musical world. That's going to drive me nuts. Okay, so they were <laughs> just finish it, finish it, finish it, finish it, finish it. They were. I, I'm, I'm just going to wait for the train to go by. You know, we were, talk about a dramatic moment. You know, I'd like to acknowledge in the audience. Again, I could start naming everybody because I know you all. Uh, but I want to mention we have two tonight. Two of the children of two of the greatest jazz people of all time. Uh, over here, we have Pauline Morris, Paula Morris, who's the daughter of Maxine Sullivan. <laughs> and a very accomplished jazz person in her own right. In fact, we could say that Maxine was your mother. Maybe that's a better way <laughs> to put it. And over here, we have the son of one of the gentlemen who is in the famous Great Day in Harlem picture. Of course, our guest tonight is in the Great Day in Harlem photo. But over here is Mr. Everard Powell, the son of the legendary Rudy Powell. He looks right. like him. Does he look? Yeah, yeah, yeah right, right. And we will talk about that. Now I'm going to go back to my, I'm going to go back to my rap about the kings because I feel really strongly about it. Come on in, come on in. For those of you that weren't around in the 1930s and 1940s, there were no men in the jazz world held in higher esteem than Coleman Hawkins and Roy Eldridge. They were absolute kings. People may focus on Count Basie and Duke Ellington and some of the big band leader names. But Coleman Hawkins and Roy Eldridge were kings among these musicians. And to think that jazz music, when you reduce it to its basic element, jazz music is rhythm, it's about rhythm. And then it's about a whole bunch of other things. And the fact that Coleman Hawkins and Roy Eldridge chose as their drummer for years and years, this gentleman right here is amongst musicians, someone being knighted by the king, or forget the king, by, by the highest person. And that's who our guest is this evening, the great Eddie Locke. Join me Thank, you. Eddie Locke. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. You're Tom welcome. Brown. Thank you. Thank you. As you all know, we, we record these interviews for the archives of the Jazz Museum in Harlem when we actually build build the museum. We're actually doing a lot of educational work already. So I just mentioned that to the audience because some of the questions that I ask looking around this audience tonight um, may seem a tad obvious to you, uh, but we have to remember that Mr. Locke is not only talking to us, but frankly he's talking to posterity because people will be looking and studying these things long after we're all gone. And so sometimes we ask questions that may just seem a little bit obvious. Also, if you have a camera tonight, uh, cameras are fine, but please uh, don't use flash, a uh, flash while we're filming, because we have our own staff photographer here who's, who's taking those. But you're all welcome to, and, uh, and all that. The format is: we'll talk for a while, then we'll take a brief intermission, and then we'll come back and do a question and answers. So, Eddie. Hello. I'd like to. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just have to. I, I'm going to start with my only piece of autobiography tonight, because there's nothing worse than an interviewer 
who starts to interview somebody and winds up talking about themselves all night. So I'm going to get my little thing out of the way. And my little thing out of the way is the very first jazz event that my parents ever took me to was I bugged them for my 15th birthday that I wanted to go see Roy Eldridge play. So they took me to Jimmy Ryan's in, 19, in the early 70s. Uh, to go see Roy Eldridge. So this man here just happens to have been, you know, the drummer on probably the first night that I ever heard a great jazz musician play in my life. So that's the, what he means to me and also what he means to so many of us, uh, someone who's been on the jazz scene for over 50 years. So I just wanted to, to say that. A big moment for me. Eddie, where and when were you born? In 1930. You can tell me where? In Detroit, Michigan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The date? August 2nd. 1930. Right. Parents' names? My mother's name was Lillian. Mm -hmm. Charles was my father's name. Mm -hmm. How did they wind up in Detroit? Well, from the South migration, you know. Where my, mother, my mother was from Birmingham. I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I don't know. Did they meet there or did they meet in the South? No, they met up North, as they called it, up North. <laughs> they met up North. <laughs> Right, right. My mother was a baby of, food, of a large family, so she was very young when she came to Detroit. Mm -hmm. Do you remember her maiden name? Cobb. C-O-B-B? -B? Yeah. yeah. Well, I'd, I'd like to start out by asking you to, kind of if you can, give us a feeling for the neighborhood and the community into which you were born and what the house was like and your memories of being a child in Detroit for people who, for whom that's a long way away. Well, it was neighborhoods, you know, that's, um, <clears throat> that's what um, people always ask about jazz and about, and they always think, they always seem to think that jazz, if you play jazz, you came from some place, some kind of environment where everybody was playing jazz. But I, I think you do, if you just come from a good environment, you learn how to do a lot of things. And, that, and uh, then you had a, people, the environment, I always hear people talking about how hard they're having it. But it always seems that the people that came was raised in the Depression were some of the greatest people we ever produced, black or white. Some of our greatest people came up in the Depression when it was supposed to be the worst time in American history. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody was poor. Sure. But their soul was different. And that's what makes a human being be whatever they are, I think. They, um, they feel better about themselves. I never thought I was poor when I was coming up. That's the misnomer about a lot of the things you hear on the radio and in the newspapers about, I never thought I couldn't do anything. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't never think I couldn't be whatever I wanted to be. Because mm -hmm. I never heard nobody say I couldn't. Mm -hmm. You know, from the time I was very small. And it came from a little, you know, it was, Detroit was big an area, mm -hmm. really large area, and it had so many little neighborhoods. And it must have had 11, 12 high schools. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your neighborhood. What was it called? Black what? Bottom. <laughs> <laughs> it was the lower east, it was the east side of Detroit, near the, near the Detroit River. And that was an area they called Black Bottom. It was a mixture of, um, it was a lot of Italians in the neighborhood and a lot of uh, blacks. But it was mixed. It was a mixed neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I always, it's so sad when I go there now because it's nothing that, that resembles um, where I was raised. Mm -hmm. Well, paint a picture for us of the community in which you were raised. Did you grow up in a house? Did you grow up in an apartment? In a house. In a house. I didn't ever know what an apartment was. Okay. In a house. Well, With a house. basement, you know, attics, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> so then tell me about the house and tell me about who lived next door and about, and, and about the street. I just want to get a, well, it was a, a all, feeling for it. It was just, it was a neighborhood where everybody knew each other. Right. For, you know, like for 20 blocks in radius, east, north, west, or south. Everybody knew each other, mm -hmm. and uh, I, well, I'll never forget when I was at a, a teach at a little school, and I was talking to the headmaster who was from Pittsburgh, and he was talking about the kids bringing the lunch. He said, "You know, I never had a lunch box." I told him, "I never had a lunch box either because I used to walk home from school, mm -hmm. and eat lunch, and then go back to school." Mm -hmm. 
you know, it was in the, the school was right in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I never really had a lunchbox either. We, we don't, were you an only child, Eddie? Or? No, I was the youngest of four boys. Can you tell me their names and how much older they were than you? My mother was like the Irish. She had them once. She's had them real quick. She had four boys in five years. <laughs> she had four boys in five years. Okay. I'm the youngest, and the oldest one is five years older than me. Can you can you get, can you give me their names, please? James, uh, Harold, Howard, and me. Uh, are, do they still survive? No, no. Only the oldest and the youngest. Right. Okay. Yeah, the oldest and the youngest. Right. Right. And nobody played music. They always say that too. Did somebody in your family play music? Not one soul. That's why I didn't ask. Because <laughs> I always say that. But I, and I, and it's, a, it's a strange dynamic because they I know a lot of musicians where nobody else in the family played music. Especially if the ones that are really turned to be professionals. You're like me. Because it's got to be something you want to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I was that big, I wanted to play the drums. How did that happen? How did you know that you wanted to play the drum? Because I saw a drum set. <laughs> <laughs> That's obvious. And I said, told my mother, it was in a window in a store, no, in a window. One of my brothers, the one that would have passed away, we used to go to, he was in a hospital his whole life, practically in and out. So every Sunday we would have to ride the bus and the streetcar. And my mother would take me because I was the youngest. And at one of these bus stops or streetcar stops, it was this little music store. And this drum set was in the window. Mm -hmm. And I always told my mother I wanted, but you know, you that I was really little. Mm -hmm. She didn't, you know, she didn't pay that much attention. So I kept doing it. Mm -hmm. Until then she bought me like a little toy drum set for Christmas one time. And of course my older brother tore it up. <laughs> <laughs> That's what older brothers right. do. Right. That's what they're here for. <laughs> right. You know, and uh, well, But I never stopped, I kept asking for it and I went to this little grad schoolhouse called Norville School mm -hmm. and um, it was a real little red schoolhouse mm -hmm. and it had a bell they rung mm -hmm. you know and they used to have a teacher that came around once a week and taught all the instruments mm -hmm. his name was Thurston he helped write those Rubank books first, he, first Thurston, name or last name that was his last name in the early Rubanks, which you'll see his name, he, uh, but, you know, he was a music educator. Right. So he taught all this, but just so happened, his major it was, had to been the drums. Right. So he would teach all the instruments all day. He would stay at the school once a week, he'd come and stay at the school all day. You know, in the morning, he'd have the horn players or whatever, and then the drummers. And luckily, just because he loved the drum. I got a found understanding of what the drum really was about. Right. This tech, I mean, rudimental things. Mm -hmm. That was the only lessons I ever had. Mm -hmm. You know, I brought us, huh? Man, I, I, back up. You paused and then, okay. I, and then I started talking and then you kept going. So I'm sorry. I, 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 Go ahead. I, I don't mean to interrupt you. Uh, I just want to back it up for a moment to your to your folks again, just before we leave, because you mentioned your mom, and I'm wondering again if you could. As best you can now, after so many years, introduce us to them. So my mom, my mom was great. That was that was my. Right. Both of them were great, but she was um, she was tough. You know, um, she didn't take no mess off of no one. She was the best with a broom you ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> she was right. a. If you try to mess with her, she go get her broom. Right. But uh, she, and she was a good person. So all the people in. The neighborhood was always at our house, you know. Mm -hmm. All the little kids and everything, you know. My mother, <laughs> there would be so many kids on the front porch in the summertime, and she would run and be running them away, and she'd tell them, "Get up and go." No, she'd go out and go in the room in the house and get a big bucket of water and <laughs> throw it on the porch, all over the porch, <laughs> and the kids would just stand on the curb because it was summertime and it would dry off and they'd come right back there and sit down. <laughs> And I used to tell them, but mom, you keep doing that, but you keep giving them things, so that's why they won't go away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. She was, uh, and when I, when she got my drum set for me when I was about 12 years old, my first drum set, that world is, you know, $5 down and a dollar a month. And she really didn't have any money, and I never stopped thanking her for that. 
because I can remember, you know, you have, like what I'm doing now, you know, people coming to hear about jazz and talk about, <laughs> didn't nobody want to hear about no jazz then. That was the worst thing you could possibly want to be. Mm -hmm. And when, I, when my mother said she was going to get me a drum set, everybody in the neighborhood, I heard them. I sat right there in the kitchen and watched them come in. Don't do it. Don't do it, Mrs. Locke. <laughs> you know, they say he's just going to be with whores and drugs and... That's all that, but that's, that was the stigma. It wasn't about how wonderful jazz was for the community or wonderful for schools like they talk about it now. You really had to want to do it then because nobody was saying you were this nice person, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. But my mother, and I'll never stop thanking her for it. She's, um, she got the drum set for me. Mm -hmm. I never left that porch that morning. Mm -hmm. I got up at 5 o'clock in the morning because I knew that's when the delivery was supposed to come. Mm -hmm. And I said, I, they couldn't get me off of that porch. Yeah. Yeah. You it mentioned was, that um, you lived in a community of 20 blocks or so where everybody knew everyone. Everybody. And if, misbehave, you know, that, and if something happened, can you d just give us either some either an anecdote or, or, or some, some way that that made your life different, that you were oh, growing it, up in a community where everybody knew you and knew what happened? Well, it made you, it brought it in the community, I mean, I think that's where all the crime came from, because when you, when you break up a communities like they did with the super highways and they disperse people all over hell, you know what I mean? Yes, that, sure. that nobody had no connections and nothing when a little kid, when I was a boy, if I was walking down the street, I could, was nothing I could do. Every person on the, every person on walking up and down the street knew who I was, you know? Yeah. Right. If I had to do something bad, it really had to be. I never forget one time me and my friend, we well, it was Alley. You everybody know what the Alley is here, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we found a dollar in the alley, and we ran down to the store and bought two cap guns and caps and all this. <laughs> and we came back, you know, popping. A, and the lady that lived downstairs under me went up to my mother and said, "Mrs. Locke, I lost a dollar." Oh, that was awful. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and my mother made us take those guns back to the store. But by being a neighborhood, it's like this is another thing, see? Right. The guy in the store knew us, knew my mother, knew everybody that, who the dollar belonged to. Right. So he gave, them, he gave us a dollar back. We gave him the cap guns and everything. Mm -hmm. And then we got our butt beat when we got back <laughs> with the dollar. Right. You know, they say, you know, that lady needed that money. And things like that make, that, you don't forget that, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that early, uh, yeah. about caring about other people, you know. What were the neighborhoods that were next to Black Bottom where you lived in? Did you go into the other areas or did oh, you pretty much just stick to your own? No, no, you went to, when I was young, I stayed in my same area, but I went, as I got older, Right. You know, got the junior high school and stuff like that. Then you want, you know, right. that's like Barry Harris and all those guys. They lived, Barry lived the closest to me of all of them. His, like the next group of people was, mm -hmm. the, 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 where he lived was was real close to me. What was that called? I don't know what they call that. Black Bottom, I don't know how it got there. It's in, it's in some of these old blues books. Right, right. Teddy Wilson used to play down in Black Bottom. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. He used to talk about it when I used to know, when I knew him. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, they had a lot of places that, that's, in, in Detroit, they had so many places to play music. That's come so many, they said that's why so many musicians came from there. Because they had, and the, because of the factories, mm -hmm. they had a bar, and every weekend, somebody was playing in there. Right. Might be a saxophone and a drum, or mm -hmm. a piano player, and a harp or something <laughs> but somebody something. whatever he could whatever guy could get in there right 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 the only funniest story i ever had because of that because i started playing professionally when i was like 12 13 years old we were working in bar i mean real bars right. nightclubs these guys say you working with they always ever that young guy says yeah i'm so long are you working i said i didn't work in nightclubs man i worked in bars it's a lot of difference. Mm -hmm. You had to play. You wasn't nobody being quiet either. That's another thing. I can't stand that shh. <laughs> Get out of here with that stuff, man. That's not how jazz was about. And nobody had to be quiet. It was as people who worked hard in the factory. They come there on the weekend, drinking their beer, and they got their chicks with them. They, you could hit right in your mouth, talk about be quiet. <laughs> 
But, you know, we played, and I'll never forget when I was up. This was about 15, 14, 15. We were playing in this place, and it was rough. All of a sudden, somebody pulled out a gun and started shooting. And it was a little bandstand, and we were, all of us got up and got on the floor, you know. We were just kids, you know, got on the floor. And the big cat, cat that owned the came and says, what are you guys, buddy, what are you boys doing? We say, man, somebody got a gun, he was shooting. He said, he wasn't shooting at you. Get up there and play, man. He <laughs> 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 wasn't shooting at you. He wasn't there. shooting at you. Get up there and play. <laughs> oh, what are you doing? Oh, you know? funny. All right, well, listen, you started playing professionally at 12. How did, how did it go from sitting on the porch waiting for the drum set to arrive to even contemplating going to play in a band and being well, on a gig? I could never, I never learned anything about music, music until I was like 18 or 19 years old. I didn't know a C from G or four bars from two. I just could play. Right. I could play all the time. And I, it's a friend of mine lives in uh, Atlanta now. His name is um, Hank Moore. He's a friend of, he knows Freddie Cole. And I called him up. He had, it was called Hank Moore and his Fantasy Four. And I played with him, you know. You know, we had jackets we wore, you know. Right. We sang Pink Champagne. It was a blues tenor player. You know, he walked the bar. Mm -hmm. And he said, I called him one time. This has been about five, six years. He said, you know what, Eddie? Lock. Nobody called me Eddie in Detroit. Lock. They called me Ed or Edward. And he said, Ed, you know what, man? You always could swing. Mm -hmm. That's what made me, until I got to a certain point where that didn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. plus I didn't know anything about music. I never studied any formal. I always say that was something, you know, I'm not real religious, but God gave me that talent to play with the people that I played with mm -hmm. that came from, I never studied no music in my life. But how did it come from unpacking the drums on that, on that thing, you know, a little drum set, to actually going and playing a gig and knowing how to play the ride cymbal? Well, that's what I'm saying. I, that's what I'm, I don't know. It just know. happened naturally. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Did you have a mentor, a role model, no. a teacher who, like, who, no. who you watched or something? No. That's amazing. It is. So who were some of the first drummers that you heard in person? Well, then when I, started, when I got old enough right. to go and hear drummers or, uh, in person, that's, you know, I must have been about 50, 16 or 17. Then I started going to the theater, like they had the Paradise Theater, Apollo, was like, like the Apollo. Mm -hmm. Sure, the Paradise. And dance, they had, that dance was in Madison Ballroom, and they had one called the Greystone Ballroom. Oh, yeah. And all the bands came there. So I used to go, and the one that, you know, the one that really made me want to play the drum, after I, I was playing the drums, but what really fascinated me was when I saw Joe Jones for the first time at the Paradise Theater. Never seen nothing like that in my life. I was just dumbfounded. Tell us about it. Well, they, they, they used to do, I don't, know what the, I don't know what the name of the tune was, but they used to call it Brushes, but it was built on some tune, mm -hmm. and that was Joe's feature. Mm -hmm. And he didn't play with nothing with brushes, with a big band. That was the most amazing thing in a theater. And I mean, and the band was shouting, mm -hmm. and he was playing with brushes. It was the most fascinating thing I ever saw in my life. When I left that theater, I couldn't believe it. Now, he was a different kind of man. <laughs> and the other thing, when I got in high school, I had this teacher that was, uh, he had taught at Cass, which was the best school in Detroit. Mm -hmm. But he came to Miller. I don't know why he came there. I guess he was to torture himself. But he, <laughs> <laughs> but he came there, and he was J.C. Hurd's teacher. So when J.C. Hurd came there once with Cab Calloway, mm -hmm. he brought J.C. Hurd to my high school just to put on a little demonstration. Now, I don't know nobody. J.C. Hurd played with Cab Calloway. Mm -hmm. right. He was about the most, the, I mean, I've never seen nobody dress as good as him. No one on walking the earth, and even in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And when he walked on that stage, I was, I, I thought, I had never seen, there was a pretty movie star, man, look <laughs> at movie. He was so sharp, he was dressed so sharp. I mean, the drumming was great, but I was just, you know what I did? I went down to a place like Stouffer's or something in downtown Detroit, and I got me a job washing dishes, and I went to this store called King Brooks, which is a 
greatest store there, but very expensive. I picked out every item that he had on as close as I could mm -hmm. and paid $10 down for about six months till I got every piece, shirt, tie, socks. I remembered everything he had on. Mm -hmm. Now I tell young people that was how I was, I was so impressed with this man. And then later on, <laughs> I got a chance to play on the same stage with him at the Metropole. Mm -hmm. So I, he came off the stage one time, and this he was really vain. And he was, I mean, he was still the same way. This is a period of, I mean, 25 or 30 years that went by from the time I did that till I was on, saw him in the... So one time he came off the stage and I walked to him and I said, you know what, JC, man? I said, I got your autograph when I was in high school. He said, shit, don't tell nobody that old as you are. <laughs> <laughs> Now, he had a brother named Dave, right? Dave, David heard. He wanted to be a pimp. J.C. wanted to be a pimp. Dave wanted to be a drummer. So, but the, but they neither one, neither of them worked out, couldn't work out. Right. So he was a drummer. David, but us. <laughs> but Coleman Hawkins was on a, I'll tell you how sharp he stayed all the time. Coleman Hawkins say he was on a tour with Jazz and Philharmonic with J.C. Hurt, and he said, he said, Locke, I never seen nobody where they never messed up. I mean, that everything is creased and pressed, his hair, never undone. Mm. So Joe Coleman, Coleman said, I got up one morning in a hotel, we went somewhere, and I said, I'm going to catch him when he's not looking cool. <laughs> you know what I mean? And he said, a rock knocked on the door. Coleman said, when J.C. opened the door, man, he had on this robe and, <laughs> wait a minute, Paj pajamas had creases in them, I had a handkerchief up here. Say, so Coleman said the funny thing, he said, he must sleep standing up against the wall. <laughs> but he was that clean, he was, uh, he was something. <laughs> He's, yeah, yeah, that was, um, yeah. but all those people made a big impression. That when I said those bands, that was the most fascinating thing. Just seeing them, it was, it was inspirational. So for a young musician of today, comes up going to jazz clubs, the musicians go on the bandstand well, well, wearing a sweater and everything, and they don't talk to the audience, it's, it's and they terrible. play some songs that they can't remember and all that kind of stuff. Tell us what the experience was like going to the Paradise Theater, to one of these places, and seeing the band as part of the presentation. What was that actually It was like? just beautiful. It was unbelievable. I mean, it, it gave you... it gave you It was, huh? Was it a movie? Or was yeah, it well, well, they showed a movie, and the, yeah, it was like a show with a movie and a, right. and a stage show and a movie. Right. You know, got a lot for your buck then, you know. Right. <laughs> but it was just, it's, it's so different. Every time a young musician, in fact, right here, the last thing was the last time I was here. When I played with those young musicians that were up here, and when I asked them, they were standing around, and remember I asked them, I said, they were trying to think of something to play, and I said, well, why not, let's play Sweet Georgia Brown. And all of them was going to jazz schools here, and not one of them, I, I was dumbfounded. I was, I was so dumbfounded, I couldn't believe it. They didn't know the old songs. They, did, they didn't know that song. I mean, it's so, and it's so many bebop songs was written off that, off that changes. Right. Modern songs, you know? Sure. But I mean, it was just, it was, it was like a different time that I would not have, uh, like people see me in that picture. When I was in that picture, when I was up there, I was followed, I used to carry Joe Jones's drums around when I, and sat them up and, which no young guy would ever do that today, because they all think they're great already. They make one CD and you can't talk to them, but they would take them. <laughs> I used to carry his drums and set them down, take them down, put them up, do all, whatever he said. He didn't want me to ask him why, just go do it, <laughs> which is what it should be. Mm -hmm. So we over explain to young people now, you know, you say, well, go do this. Or well, after I go do that. No, no, don't ask me why, just go do it. But when I, I wouldn't have been in that picture if I hadn't been with Joe. Mm -hmm. 
because he, uh, he told me to meet him there, and I met him there. Right. And when I was walking down the street, coming to that spot, and I saw all these people, I didn't know, I said, oh my God, I said, Joe Jones invited me to a funeral, and I don't even know the people. <laughs> <laughs> I, you, know, I mean, you know, but just all these people right. outside, I couldn't think of nothing else, you know. that um, You came up at a magical time. You said you were born in 1930, so... It was. Right, so you're talking the, the, the 40s, so we're talking Dave Tuff and Shadow Wilson and Big Sid Catlett. Oh, great. Right. Rosie Cole and Gene Krupa well, let me and tell you, Alvin Burroughs. Let me tell you something. The only thing is different, they don't, the drummers don't play the drums now. They do little things, but they don't play the drums. You don't hear the sound of the drums like you did from those drummers. The drums has a sound mm -hmm. that was just like, that was a blended with the instruments. Mm -hmm. Not overpowered the instrument, mm -hmm. it blended with the instruments. Right. But it was a sound that those drummers got that made those bands sound so good. Absolutely. You know? I used to go do these little talks like I'm doing now. And I said, the drummer, when you're playing, they said, but people can't dance. I said, if they can't, the only reason they can't dance is because the drummer won't make them, let make them dance, you know? The drummer has to make them dance, mm -hmm. not the horns. The drummer is what makes them dance. And I, one time I said, I was trying to, I always would do this, demonstrate this to the school, I said, if you, if you playing at a, for somebody dancing, or whatever, anybody, and you playing a tempo, and you play a tempo like you say, and you do that. Now, if you say, they think you're going faster. Mm -hmm. The people mm -hmm. do. That's mm -hmm. what Jimmy Lunchford probably figured that out. Oh, the two beat is. Th that's to the right. Court. Right. Because if they do that, and you can play, right. they sound like you're going faster. If you do that, right, right. So he always kept that, in that thing, that feeling. Right. And Joe Jones knew how to do that and still play four four. Mm. Joe Jones, that's what he played. How did he? He used that? that two. Roy Eldridge, when the first one told me about that, and so I started watching him. It was really true. He said, when Joe is playing, man, he's playing two and four at the same time. Because he would just act, he would just uh, and make the first and the third beat, just a little emphasis, not, mm -hmm. but you could feel it. Mm -hmm. So he had the four and the two going, to, so that's when the dancing. Yeah. Now, speaking of dancing, I don't know how many people here even know anything about Bop and Lock, <laughs> but uh, I'd, I'd, I'd like you to tell us about your career with Oliver Jackson and your career as a dancer. Well, that's how I came to New York. I. Uh, it was a drummer named Oliver Jackson. We were raised with the, together. We went to the same high school. And uh, we had seen this group called Red and Curly, who used to travel around. And they played the drum. They were tap dancers, and they played the drums. So we did it the opposite way. We were drummers, and we tap danced. We, we thought we tap danced, anyway. <laughs> but anyway, we rehearsed this act. That's how I got to New York, a song and dance, man. Uh, we rehearsed this act in Detroit every day. And I tell the young people this when I talk to young people about this. Now, this was something we did with no money, and we didn't have no nothing other than our, the will to want to do it. And nobody was asked, made us do it. Every day we used to rehearse. We got somebody's garage. They let us put the drums in them. We used to go rehearse every day. And we made up the music. And we taught ourselves how to dance. We were the worst dancers <laughs> I've ever seen. But anyway, no, but, but you know what? It, it was not because we didn't do it to try to fool anyone. We just was doing the best we could. We knew what, what we had. Mm -hmm. So when we came to, we played a job in the, the only, and the only reason we ever made it, we had a, a as they called Oliver's mother used to say, your white father, who was a man named George Hamilton, that ran a drum shop in Detroit, 
you know, because every time somebody tells me about black and white, I never can, I don't, I don't get, I don't get it because I've had a white people, white person, that man did more for me and Oliver mm. than anyone. He got this drum set. He made, we went down to his drum, he had a son that was a drummer too, but his son was, he wasn't, he liked us because we were really interested because he was a drummer. Mm -hmm. He played in like the Detroit band, Shells. Mm -hmm. he, this man gave us two drum sets. Mm -hmm. He built this platform, I mean, in his drum shop mm -hmm. with the rollers on it to, 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 so we could roll it out on the stage set up. Mm -hmm. He did all of this for us without one penny, one dollar. And we went to play the Colonial Theater in Detroit. And we had some kind of shyster uh, kind of uh, agent, you know. It used to be a lot of those guys, you know. They could talk their way into anything. So he sold us to this theater. Right. And we played uh, with like a weekend. And for some kind of way out of that, he submitted us to the Apollo Theater. Mm. <laughs> and we didn't have no record. We didn't have nothing. And then they, they took us. That was unbelievable. So that's like starting to play baseball and then being signed by the Yankees. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I mean, that, that, that was jump, equivalent. Right? That's right. right. It was a, a, absolutely. Right. So now here we go. <laughs> we got these drums and we got all this stuff. We couldn't have ever got here. If we, if, at that time, they still had boxcars on trains. You know, you used to put stuff in them. When you like, if you were riding the train, because mm -hmm. we could, that was a lot of equipment. Mm -hmm. Two full drum sets mm -hmm. and two platforms on rollers. Jesus. <laughs> that that this drum sat on. So we put down, went down to the train station, put all this stuff in there, and got on the train. We got off right around the corner here, man. Mm -hmm. I never forget. We stopped. We 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 left the stuff downtown. They had baggage rooms too. Then in Grand Central Station, they, they don't have those anymore. No way. So with all this stuff we couldn't have did. Right. But when I got off that, we got off that. It was in July when I came. When we came down those steps there on 125th Street. When I stepped out there on the street, it scared me to death. <laughs> I had never seen that many people on the street before in my life. I it, other than a parade, I was scared. I, I, I wanted to go back up there, so pick up those steps, man. And we had our suitcases, so we were singing to Teresa. Oh. That's where the, they booked us in the Teresa, because it's right by the Apollo, right? So we went, we walked down there. We walked from here right. to, the, to the Teresa. We checked in, did all the stuff. Then we go up to the Apollo, and we had our little rehearsal with the band. We had big band arrangements. We paid for them. They were paid for were really good. We, I still have them. Huh. And um, all, nobody had ever heard of us or seen us. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I find this out later. All the dancers in New York, they didn't like that stuff. No dancers, we don't, we don't, what are they doing at the Apollo, you know? Right. Honey Coles, all, I mean, all the great dancers, they were there for the first show, they said. Oh, Lord. And then and Honey Coles told me this. He said, yeah, man, we all, we all got there, man. We were sitting there, must have been about 20 of us. Who are these young dancers? We haven't, how come we haven't heard of them? <laughs> He said, man, when you guys came out there, y'all were sad. <laughs> he said, y'all were so sad. We said, well, maybe they're just getting warm up. They're nervous. They just, uh... <laughs> he said, when y'all came out for the second show, y'all were sadder. <laughs> and um, we did take lessons. We went to Henry Latang. All those dancers told him, say, say, listen, you boys, okay, okay. He said, but Tim, you got to do something about that dance <laughs> and we, no we used to tell jokes that I, that I left out something we had some jokes you know where we got the jokes from 
You know how in the back of comic books you see that send for those books? You get the jokes. jokes right. We sent and got these joke books. And it was, <laughs> oh, God. So after we did the first show, <laughs> Mr. Schiffman, if he didn't, he always watched the first show. Frank Schiffman. That ran, yep, that ran the Owned Apollo. He always saw the first show. And if he didn't like you, you were gone. Mm -hmm. That's it. He didn't want you. He'll pay you, but you're gone. He didn't want you on the show. So when we came off that, the first show was over, he had a loudspeaker, Bop and Lock, went in Mr. Schiffman's office. Uh, and and every, all the old guys hung around the backstage. They, oh, I feel sorry for you young kids, man. <laughs> we didn't even know what they were talking about. You know, right. they knew when they called you to the office, usually that means. Right. Right. So we came in. He said, sit down. He said, listen. He said, you guys play the drums nice, you sing all right, you know. Dance is okay. He said, but there was jokes. He said, <laughs> he said, cut those jokes out. He said, none of them, don't tell them no jokes. <laughs> so he, he kept us, you know. So we made the gig, but he said, them jokes. No, I'm getting rid of those jokes, man. Tell us about the act. What was the... How did it start? What was the what was the act? Because I can't imagine like what a drumming dancing act is. I mean, well, well just saying, you came out. We opened, had an opening number. We wrote called Drummer Man, mm -hmm. and we come out singing. Got it. Of course. But how 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 did the song go? <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> that's that's for another session. <laughs> <laughs> but it's um, you know, we did the drumming. No, we came out singing. Then we'd go to the drumming. And would you both like play it was, it, it, and it trade was, with each other? Oh like no, that's what it was. It was like right. um, uh, synchronized drums. We play, we did everything the same. Got it. With both hands, both our hands were doing the same thing at all times. That took a long time because we. He, if you're playing an instrument, you know everybody's gonna have a little favor of something they want to do on the instrument, right. different from another guy. Right. So for two people to do the exact, and we were playing intricate stuff. Mm -hmm. To be doing it the same way. When his hand was up, mine was up, like that, you know. So that took a long time. And we used to throw the stick, like he would throw a stick to me, I would throw a stick to him across the stage, like mm -hmm. that, you know, like that, and he'd throw one back to me. Mm -hmm. That took a lot. Mm -hmm. And the dancing, we, had, we were acrobats too, you know. We used to jump over a handkerchief into splits, and I can't do that stuff. <laughs> But it was bad, but we was, but you know, but you know what, it, but the only thing it was that people never, the people didn't never think it was bad because we were doing it from our heart. We wouldn't do it and say, we're putting over something on the, someone. It was, that wasn't in our psyche about it. That's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. You know, and I tell every young person, if you do something from your heart, it'll work. If you b do something, I don't care what it's, whatever it is, if you're not doing it because you think, well, I'm going to do this and get over there, fool these people or something. We weren't thinking like that. The audiences at the Apollo they were, like, notorious for, like, right. sn sniffing out somebody who wasn't for real, right? That's right. And so, that we, so the fact that you weren't that's carried right. off by Puerto Rico or something. Absolutely. We made, the, we made the whole thing. And the biggest thing, the greatest thing that happened to us was one time Cozy Cole came to, the, to uh, Detroit with Louis Armstrong. And we went down to the theater and went backstage and asked the guy, would he tell Mr. Cole that as two young drummers that live here would like to have a word with him? And those guys, that's the difference in these, those guys and the ones today now. That, you know, he came down to the stage door, and then he brought us in, and he talked to us. And we said, where, he, where it was at the Fox Theater they were playing, biggest one of the biggest theaters. And we asked him, would he come on one of his intermissions to our little rehearsal place? Because it wasn't far from there. And he said yes. And the next day he did come and watch us rehearse. And after, he was at our first show at the Apollo, too. He came backstage. He said, you guys are pretty good, you know. And he, that's when him and Gene had that school. Him and Gene he said, if you, if you guys need anything, come down to the school and see us, man. Come down and hang out. And it's worth, it's worth commenting that... that 
Cozy Cole was known to be like one of the most technically proficient yeah. Yeah. and you know precise drummers who played all the rudiments and taught. So, yeah. so he was like the PhD of yeah. doctor of drummers in a way. But uh, just the yeah. nicest person. Right. Right. So anytime we got lonesome in Detroit, you know, in New York, we'd go down, you know, because mm. we said after we finished the, the Apollo, you, we, we moved downtown to the Alvin, because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. that was closer to the whole scene of... Give me a year, Eddie. Can you tell me how 1954. You 154. Okay. All right. Yeah. So before we get too much into your life in New York, just to go back to Detroit, Detroit. for a moment. Oh, back to Detroit. Uh, was it there or was it later on that you became aware of, let's say... Barry and Tommy and oh no, Bad we had, and well, Barry, but Tommy was Tommy was our accompanist with the act. That's how we he was our rehearsal. <laughs> he was our rehearsal piano player. Tell really? us about it. <laughs> <He was>. Okay. <laughs> people, I tell people that they say, "You Tommy Flanagan used to rehearse you guys with on the drum." I say, "Yeah, he he rehearsed all our songs with us." <laughs> and when you remember New Faces, Leonard Silman, I don't know anybody here remember that. that Ninety-two. If they, he did it every year, that's where that's where uh, Eartha Kitt came from, mm -hmm. Roger Clary, a mm -hmm. bunch of people. Mm -hmm. Every year he'd go around the country right. and do auditions. Right. So we told Tommy, "Man, we're going to do this audition." He said, "Okay." And they would do the auditions in big theaters, of course, mm -hmm. where he would be appearing with his show. So we go to the theater. Now, we're up on a stage like that, and Tommy is down the pit piano, like, and Leonard Selman is sitting right there like that, you know. So Tommy, he always tells everybody this story. He said, yeah, man, when you guys came out, man, and you started singing, man, he said, the guy was saying, mm-hmm. Yeah, he said, you guys got on the drums. The guy was saying, mm -hmm. y'all started telling him sad jokes. <laughs> so he took his pencil out in the direction. <laughs> so he just yeah. took the pencil out and said, <laughs> so you guys started telling him sad jokes. <laughs> Tell me about the community in in uh, in Detroit at that time with Thad Jones and Oh, that Elvin was the greatest. And, and all those people. And me and Elvin used to together all the time right but it, you know when when Tommy Flanagan passed away mm. and he was uh, I was at his wake and Peter Jennings you know Peter Jennings loved him Peter Jennings was standing there and we were talking and he said you know what and he said you know what there's so many musicians came from this. and he said you know one time I asked Tommy that and I said his answer really surprised me and I asked him, why did so many great musicians come from Detroit? I said, well, what did he tell you? He said, he said, they had great schools. He didn't say music schools. Mm -hmm. And they did have great schools there. My eighth grade education was better than some of these junior college educations are today. You know why? Of course, you had to do the work, man. There's no jiving around. You know, these people go to school now, and they can't do this, and they can't do that, you know. Mm -hmm. There wasn't no excuses. Mm -hmm. You know, I see my mother whip my oldest brother in front of the whole class in school with her strap because he what, did something bad in the school, and, and, the teacher, and she whipped him right in front of the whole class. It wouldn't do nobody would ever think about doing nothing like that. But he never did that again. <laughs> it didn't, right. You know what I mean? It was just a, it's a, the schooling, you can't play music, you know that, unless you have some kind of intellect. Mm -hmm. So when he said we had good schools, right. it helped your mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and in Detroit, all of us were together. We all, you know, we all shared. Barry Harris had a little band. And I put you, you remember that, that that movie they made, The Shadow People, about the guys that made all that music for Motown? Mm -hmm. They made a movie. Yeah. The Shadow People. Yeah. Well, the guy that helped us start it, his, he was, we, we, we had a band together. His name was Earl Van Dyke. Yeah. He was the pianist. And he lived on my block. Mm -hmm. So we had this band. They called it Earl Van Dyke and the Hungry Five. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> 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 That's when we were young. So we get to this. The Paradise Theater had amateur shows just like the Apollo. Mm -hmm. So we get on this amateur show, and Barry's on it, too, with his little band. And it was some other people on it, but it got down to be just the two of us, his band and our band. 
And I always tell, Barry makes me tell his story every place I'm with him. Now, <laughs> Barry's band, we were all right. But we had this guy named Don Juan, man, that played guitar and man that had his head down and he was big and he'd stomp, man, and dust would be flying up, man. He would, could play the blues. That's all we played was the blues. Right. And Barry was playing, you know, one of them, one of those bebop tunes or something, of course. Now, when they came out with them, got to the time to hold the thing over each other's head, you know. So they held the thing over our head, you know, and the kids clapped, blah, blah, blah. When they held the thing over Barry's head, man, the band's head, the place went crazy. I said, now, wait a minute, they weren't that much better. It's so when they turned the lights up, Barry had every kid from his high school. They all had the high school sweaters on. <laughs> <laughs> He's just like he is now. Right, right, right. He, the same thing. Right, right. This way he, all of them, they were, they were the Northeastern. Right. They all, I know they were green and white. They all, when they turned the lights up, the whole theater <laughs> was filled. And I tell him about that now. I say, that, your band wasn't that much better than us, man. <laughs> But that was, uh, he was something, you know. He was, he was teaching like that, just like he's doing now in Detroit. The same the thing. Same. The same thing. He taught, he taught uh, Roland Hanna how to play changes. Because mm -hmm. he was a classical piano player. Mm -hmm. And he buried, he, I mean, Roland, I mean, uh, Roland talked about that all the time. Mm -hmm. He to go up to Barry's house. Did Charlie Parker come through town? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I saw him a couple times, quite a few times. Guys used to sit in with him when he came to Detroit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Were there any of the musicians left? Or you mentioned the Greystone Ballroom, which was famous for McKinney's Cotton McKinney's Pickers. McKinney's Cotton Pickers. And uh, Cuba Austin. Yeah, they, yeah. I didn't see him, but they right. tell me he was something. Were there any of those old-time guys left when you were Yeah, but that's what well, that's the other... They were old-time then. But that's, that's the other thing that was good. Barry said this. He said, when they tell me, ask me, I always say, we had great musicians in Detroit that never, ever came to New York, older guys right. had great bands. Once some of these bands stayed in these clubs like for six, seven, eight years right. with the same band. Right. And those guys were really, you know, I called up, you know, Frank Foster when he got out of college, he went to Wilberforce, I think. Mm -hmm. He came right to Detroit. Because he always says, man, I could play fast, but Detroit taught me how to swing. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, because he said, so when I, I called him up about six or seven months ago about something and we started talking and he said he said yeah man it was a it was a band out there king porter man he had this guy called lefty edwards play tenor and all he did all night was just i don't care what you did he was in there pumping mm -hmm. but he said frank foster said man that guy used to wear me out man because i'd be playing all them notes and he would just say boom Boom. <laughs> Boom. You know, just, you know. Right, yeah, sure. Never. He said he taught me a lesson. That's right. It wasn't many, many, uh, mm -hmm. it was many bands like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Barry, and Barry always had a band somewhere. And, uh, what about the Bluebird? So that was a great place. Tell me about the Bluebird. What was it? it was just a bar. That's what I'm saying. All of these places were bars, they weren't nightclubs. Just, Bars where cats came off of work, you know, from the factory and came by and had a beer and a shot, you know, mm -hmm. and they played. You, nobody was being quiet. Right. But why did they talk about the Bluebird as opposed to the other places? Because Bluebird lasted continuously with jazz, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And then everybody started coming there to play. You know, Miles spent about a year there. No, I did not. You didn't know that? Oh, yeah. 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 It's a funny story about it, though. <laughs> you know Lonnie Hillier? When he was a kid, that's when he was a little young kid. That's when Miles was there. Mm -hmm. And so he would go sit on the curb, you know, out in front of the place, just listen. You could hear. It was just a bar. They had the door open. Of course, Miles, you know, we, that's when he had some of his bad periods in his life. Then he got rid of his horn. So Lonnie brought him a horn, mm -hmm. his horn. Miles is playing and playing one night, and Lonnie's mother come in there and snatched the horn right out of her hand. She said, if you're so, if you're so famous and so good, I hope you ain't got no horn. You got my baby's horn here. You ain't going to play it no more, though. 
<laughs> and he was saying, the mother was saying, this mama, you know, a real mama, man. Right. And she walked in, what you doing? My baby's horn. If you're supposed to be so fat, come here, you got no horn. <laughs> they laughed about that for years around Detroit. Yeah. But, but, but you know what's so funny about it? What's so wonderful about it? It really speaks to family <laughs> yeah. and community and the way that the music was, I guess, just. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like that. I mean, uh, it wasn't being played. Uh, Oh yeah, I used to go to the, you know, the, the, used to go to the Elvin's house. Everybody's house, you could play, go play. Everybody's house has they had a piano. I mean, in the daytime, nighttime, everywhere, all over Detroit, it was. Was like that around, or was he gone? That you no, know, he was around most of the time that during that period. Mm -hmm. That's when him and Billy Mitchell had. That's when Elvin developed all that stuff. He did. He developed it on this one gig. Well, how did the, tell me about that? Well, that was a, it was a band with Thad and mm -hmm. Billy Mitchell and. Be Beans Richardson was a bass player. That's how come that. That's how come Elvin developed that because of this bass player. He was just a bass player. His bro Rodney Richardson was his brother. Okay. Remember, he played with Count Basie for. But he just played the time. Never said do doom or zoom or mm -hmm. But you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I don't care. It never went nowhere. Mm -hmm. So Elvin, that's when he started fooling around with that stuff that he was in. Because when I first met Elvin, he was just playing like every other drummer, you know. Right. But the time was so secure. Right. He, if he got he even, he, go off even if he got off, right, he could always find his way back because this guy wouldn't. They never go nowhere. <laughs> he never played a solo right. or nothing. He never played. And, and 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 you and you mean this is something very good, huh? When you said he didn't go anywhere because oh, yeah. he was so rock solid. The solid. It, right. He could, he could depend. It on freed him up to be right. do all that stuff. That's fascinating. It was, and that band, that band was um, was at the Bluebird, so everybody came that Sunny Stitt. That's why it got so famous. Who Plus, was Terry Pollard? She was the greatest pianist. You know, she played with Terry Gibbs. She played vibes too. But she, you know, did you know Barry? About a year ago, you know, she's in a home up here. No. Yeah, up in the Bronx. Terry Pollard. Yeah. Oh, geez. You didn't hear about that? No. Barry got a bunch. Barry, she was one of the greatest pianists and a harp player. Terry Pollard. Ter and vibe players. She played with Terry Gibbs band, but she was one of the greatest jazz. She took Tommy's place with that band when Tommy went to the Army. That's how good she was. So Barry had this thing up in the Bronx. She's in a home up in the Bronx. She had a stroke or something, so she can't use her limbs that well. This was, not, this was about a year ago. Mm -hmm. Barry got all these people. He called up Yusuf. Yusuf came all the way down here from, that's how good she was, mm -hmm. from up there in Massachusetts down here. Yusuf Latif. Right. Yusuf Latif. And he was sitting there. I'll never forget this as long as I live. He was sitting there, and Terry Pollard was just like, you know, her little arms was going like this, you know. And he was sitting there, and tears were streaming down his cheeks. Mm -hmm. And he was saying, man, I feel like I'm back home again. You know? And then they held her up, and she could play the vibes with one hand, like, you know. Oh, Lord. And she played it with one hand like that, you know. Mm -hmm. And and it, it, it was it was one of the most amazing things. Billy Taylor came to see her too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was just it was it was one of those kind of uh, things. It was just like being in Detroit because that's the way we were in Detroit. We were talking about Detroit and all the wonderful things <clears throat> that happened there. But you really <coughs> enter the the major leagues of jazz music. Um, when you come to New York and you wind up uh, playing as a member of a rhythm section that is, among jazz musicians is, you know, one of those rhythm sections where they just talk about a magical people. And it was Tommy Flanagan, Major Holly, that's right. and yourself. Well, that's what I wanted to talk. When he wrote that album, that's what I wanted to say something about. Right. Because everybody that hear those records, it was about 10 albums we made. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget it. The first time it really came to my mind, Mike LaDon had heard the one we did on the music to No Strings. Oh, yeah. And so I told Mike LaDon, I said, we never rehearsed. He said, I don't believe that. He said, you never, y'all didn't rehearse. I said, we played with that quartet over 10 years. And all the music we made on all those records, most of the time, we, Coleman had never seen, played none of those songs a lot of times. You know, they had those A&R guys, and they would bring the music sure. in, you know, that was, uh, uh, people don't even know about that now. The guys used to, that's what used to be a guy that brought music for you. Mm -hmm. uh, but 
and I tried to explain to them, I said, you know, that quartet was um, the finest example of what jazz really is supposed to be. It was about caring about each other. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't find fault with each other. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So that consequently, that made everybody play better. Of course, we couldn't find fault with Oklahoma Heart, but I mean, just as a quartet, it was never none of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. You know? I mean, I hear guys now I play with, and I never heard Coma Calkins ask the piano, Tommy, what, what song, what chord was that you played or something? You know, kind of like, you know, I didn't like it. Or, you know what I'm saying? You know, that doesn't happen too often when Tommy Flanagan's playing. No, piano. but, <laughs> but you know, hey, man, you'd be surprised how some people are when they get in a situation right. where they're in charge. I wouldn't it does, be it does It doesn't doesn't make any difference whether you could be a genius and he could find something to let you know he's in charge. I understand. You understand right. what I'm saying? I, I do. Okay. But that's what I mean. And, mm -hmm. and everybody's, when that guy brought that, rec, that CD for me to sign today and now, everybody that asks me, and I tell them that, they don't believe it. Michael Down said, I can't, I don't believe you guys didn't. I said, and not only hadn't we had never rehearsed, we had never seen that music to the day that that date was. And then many people record that music and maybe that's with some what, strange music on there. I'm just thinking that, you know, maybe that's part of what made it such a great album. Because with musicians of the caliber of Coleman Hawkins, Eddie Locke, Major Holly, and Tommy Flanagan, mm -hmm. who are playing a, re you know, a regular repertoire as a quartet all the time, mm -hmm. and you get musicians like that, and you give them like a big piece of meat like that, some great, odd oh, music. Yeah. And what, what that record, I guess, actually captures is the actual, it's almost like Miles Davis's kind of blue, uh -huh. where they say that they had never heard that music either. And right. they just turned on the microphone, and the genius came out. And uh, thank God that most of these albums that Eddie made with Coleman Hawkins are now all available on CD. For many years, they were hard to find. Yes, they were hard to find. But now they're all out, and, and, and you can get them all. But that always just amazed me. Yeah. That, that, uh, it didn't amaze me there, because when you're in it, you didn't, it amazes me now more than it did at the time because when you're in it you just mm -hmm. you can't see it because you're in it mm -hmm. and it didn't seem we never had any dist that's the only four people I ever played with where we never had any thing going on mm -hmm. never mm -hmm. we were together all the time mm -hmm. and never 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 well, sounds like we made the music work all the time you know? Eddie, for people who will be looking at this interview, as I mentioned, in 50 years from now, <laughs> or 100 years from now, if, if, some, if, if there's a world, <laughs> if, uh, what, what do they need to know about Coleman Hawkins? Well, I'll tell you, I've been around a lot of musicians in my life. I mean, really great musician. But I think he undoubtedly was the most musical person i ever been around. Musically. And his, cause his foundation, you know, everybody knows that he, he came from, you know, piano to the cello and then the saxophone. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he loved music so much. So it was just like, Unbelievable in that, you know, I told that to Stanley Dance and that, you know, that when he put me in that World of Swing book, Como was at my house one time and um, for dinner and, you know, I got these, um, I loved Rubenstein and we had these, Ruben, because of him I loved Rubenstein, I had these encores, it was, a, it was just a seat and we were sitting down eating and he started, tears just started coming down his cheek. And he told my wife, he said, honey, don't pay me no mind. He said, that's just so pretty. It's bringing tears to my eyes. Now, I ain't never somebody love me, love, love music. He loved music so much. You know, and he said, I love pretty music. And you can hear it when he plays, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a part of jazz that really got lost. And that's how come, you know, <laughs> you know, you hear, I hear this all the time. They said, well, man, black people don't come in here jazz. I said, because y'all ain't playing no jazz. Oh, yeah. 
you ain't playing jazz. That's why they don't come. You know, they, they people want to feel good. They don't want to come there to figure out no crossword puzzle or nothing. You understand? <laughs> I, you know, they want to feel good. That's what that's. Listen, it's it's so weird when I hear that. I hear it all the time. How did you? No. How did you meet Coleman Hawkins? Because again, like we were talking before about like. Uh, Playing the Apollo Theater and jumping from the from the from the minor leagues to like to the to the to the Yankees, I mean, how did it happen? This is how it happened. How did it happen? I met Roy Eldridge was the first. That's I I met Roy Eldridge by because I was playing with uh, uh, Hal Singer. Remember Hal Singer played Born tenor, red. and we were playing a job out in Brooklyn, and Roy. It was like a Sunday afternoon. There used to be a lot of those kind of things. Sunday afternoon, and Roy was the special guest, mm -hmm. right? And I had never played with him before. He didn't even know. He knew who I was from being around the Metropole a little bit, just a little bit, he said. So we, when he got ready to play, he came over to the drums, you know, and I, got I was getting nervous right away. And, <laughs> and this was his musical education. So whatever you do, just keep hitting those things. Don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> just keep hitting them, he said. And when I played with him, he used to like to sing those Louis Jordan songs. Mm -hmm. He loved Louis Jordan, and I did too. That's how I learned how to play the shuffle, listening to Chris Colombo, who was Louis Jordan's drummer. But I played that shuffle for him. From that day on, I was his drummer. He said, man, can't no young drummers play that, man. Said, yeah, you my drummer. You know, I said, I'm not, I'm not have no, you don't even have no job, but you don't call me your drummer. But he was, we could be fun, have fun with him like that. Right. But so I met him, and then we started playing. See, a lot of people associate me with Roy from Jimmy Ryan, but I was playing with Roy long before Jimmy Ryan's. Right. I made the first, my first jazz record that I ever made was, was On the Town. With a Ronnie Ball? Ronnie Ball. That's the guy's album. He, and Roy plays the mute mm -hmm. and everything except one number. And then on that record, a lot of people don't even know that was the first time they used the, the, the word bossa nova on a jazz album in, in America. Yeah. You, didn't, you didn't know that, we, but we didn't play a bossa nova. Mm -hmm. He played the blues. Wow, wow, like that. But a lot of people, that's a good trivia question. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll let Phil Phil's chat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, okay, Roy, you know, right. I was playing with Roy. Right. So somebody came up with the idea that Coleman and Roy, we were gonna, they, they wanted them to come and play in the Metropole, with a, you know, with a, as a quintet. So Roy said, I told Coleman, I'll get the drummer. So Coleman said, well, I'm going to get the piano player. Because that's the way they both thought that different about music. You, you can tell the way they play. So he wanted changes and he wanted the rhythm. Right. right. You know, right. he said, you, okay, Coleman said, I'm going to get the piano player. So Roy said, no, but I'm going to get the drummer then. Right. So he got me. And we had an assortment of bass players. You would not believe. Because they couldn't. That was a tough job in the Metropole. I remember one week I lost seven pounds in one week. Why was it a difficult job? Because it was you were on every minute. It was you know because you were up there on that behind that bar. Can you describe it? Was no it for no place who were never there. It was just a long bar from that wall to that one, or maybe longer. The bar was that long or longer, mm -hmm. and the place was like that. It wasn't much deeper than this. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And but you were like, and the people were just standing there looking at you. You know, they were that close. I mean, they were really close. And they, and it was like, wham, bam, wham. I mean, every, it was no fooling around up there. You know what I mean? And boy, we had so many bass players because they couldn't deal with it. Because it was just like, boom. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Until we found Major. Major was, when they got Major, we wore out about five bass players before we got Major. <laughs> <laughs> when Major came in, that was it. Right. So now Coleman still ain't, you know, we ain't, we're not talking yet. Because those guys were very funny, you know. <laughs> we, he wasn't talking to me yet. So one night, 
I was playing behind Roy. You know, Roy was playing and I was playing. And he kind of walked over to me and he said, are you playing like that when I'm playing? <laughs> in other words, he said, I was playing more. But, you know, but, and I probably was. You're playing for your boy. Uh, yeah, because right. that, that, this relationship with him, Roy and I had, you know, that, that was so funny. Him to say, he says, are you playing like that when I'm playing? <laughs> and from that, from, that, from that period, from that, that's when my relationship started with Coleman. And then, then I started playing with them separately as a quartet. Because they didn't work together that much. You know, that nobody wouldn't hire them together. It was too expensive? Yeah, that's what they said, but it was just, well, I don't even want to go there. But anyway, <laughs> you know, it's just like ridiculous. And uh, so I worked with Roy Eldridge's quartet, and I worked with Coleman's quartet. And then that caused a little friction, because Roy, <laughs> you know, Roy wouldn't, didn't, he had, he had something about him that wanted to be, he wanted me to be with him. Even if he wasn't working. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, sure. He was a very sensitive guy, you know. And uh, i never forget one time he was playing at that place. The em it was, that was before you came here. Probably. The Embers? The Embers. The Embers yeah, yeah. Not the Embers on the east side. No, 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 no. It was the uh, Embers on the west side huh. in this hotel. It was a little, one of them, one of them hotels right there in the 40s mm -hmm. in that bar. Well, it didn't last a long time. Mm -hmm. But Roy started playing there, like, like a house band almost. Mm -hmm. And we were playing down, I was at the Village Gate with Coleman. Right. So when we got finished, because we got to finish for him, we come up there to hang out. Mm -hmm. And so Coleman comes in the club and says, yeah, man, we tore it up down there. Because Coleman liked them. He likes to keep stuff. He likes to right. signify. We told he because he knew how Roy was too. Right. So he's, right. Yeah, he's putting the thing. Well, he, <laughs> he's Roy. He, got, he was mad. He said, "Yeah, I guess you did tear it up down there. He got a bass player singing in the bass, a drummer playing with his toes and his fingers." <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. So it's uh. When I look at you and I and I think of all those nights of music that you made and that you heard, Ooh. and all those Coleman Hawkins ballads, and all those hun hundreds and thousands of, of songs, and body and souls, and everything that you, that you were part of. Um, can, you, can you tell us about some well, I tell, exceptional well, I tell, nights? No, when I tell everybody, when I, when I'm now, I mean, I tell people this all the time. If I never, ever played music again in my life, I would never be unhappy because as very few hum humans have had the opportunity to do what I did. It's not because they weren't good or nothing either. It's something, something smiled on me that I was able to play. I mean, playing with one of them would have been enough. Right. But to play with Roy Eldridge and Coleman Holland, both, <laughs> it was, that's, that, that, it's like Jack Martin Luther King said, I've been on top of the mountain and I've seen the other side. <laughs> And it's really, I mean, it's really amazing. I, I don't, I try not to, because they told me don't hear ghosts. That's what they used to tell me. But for the, it still comes to me now sometimes when I'm playing with people. It's not, it's, it's just not there. The things that I felt when I played with them. It was just like unbelievable feeling. As Col <laughs> Joe Jones told me this one time. He said, you know what? You know, he was my mentor, mentor, and uh, he said, one of these days you're going to be playing with Roy Eldridge, and he's just going to lift you right out of that drum seat. <laughs> I said, what is he talking about? You know, because Joe would say something, but he would never, exp he would never say, he'd throw something at you like that and leave you. Years went by, and one time I was up in Toronto, Canada with Roy, and, you know, I used to do this feature on Caravan all the time, right? And we were on a bandstand, was in behind a bar in Toronto, and up on the bar. And, mm. and man, we got to that middle. Man, he hit a note, man. And it did, it took me right out of that. I couldn't even play. Mm. 
I couldn't even play the bridge. He just played the bridge by himself. I couldn't, I couldn't even play. It was just like so dynamic. Yeah. You know, well, I, if I can just because this is the only the second point which I'm just going to inject something. I experienced that with this guy, and I was you know I don't know 18 or 19 or whatever and bugging them a lot and and sitting in with Roy Eldridge's band, and and as I understand it, the guys in the band used to kind of look for when somebody sat in and played Caravan because Eddie would play the Tom Toms and everything, and then they go into this thing and then they get to the bridge, and they hit the swing <laughs> part, and if you didn't know it was coming. I mean, you might, you know, it'd be fierce. You, might, you know, fall off the bandstand or, you know, or something like that. Because it was fierce. I, it was unbelievable. And yeah. I just want to say that I can testify to that because I was, I was, I, I experienced it with, with them, and it was something that you'll never. And, and you know, I'm just thinking about some gigs I did with you when Roy couldn't play anymore and he was singing. Oh yeah, it was and the same did, way when he sang. And we did a gig at the Brooklyn Museum of Art once, and I Roy remember. sang. And it was the same, same thing. electricity. That's right. That you felt absolutely. And so, just to hear you talk about it, just well, it he was a—he was a, one of these Perfect people. Question, he, he's never studied music. He never studied the trumpet. I mean, and every classical mm -hmm. trumpet player, every great trumpet player in the world, I met when I was playing with him because they all came, and I was playing, standing with one of them one time, and he was Roy was playing. And he said, "Look at him." That he's pressing the wrong valves and playing the, and playing the right notes. What are talking about? <laughs> Says so pressing the wrong valves and playing the right notes. What yeah. he's playing on his chops? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. mind over matter. Yeah, he mm -hmm. just didn't. It, somebody would say, "What changed?" What, what? He said, "I don't know what you're talking. What changed?" You know, this this is the finest example of Roy Eldridge as I've ever heard in my life. He told me this story, you know, because when he came up. When I, when I got to him, he did know a little about it. But when he first started, he didn't know nothing about music, mm -hmm. like changes and all that right, stuff. Right. He was just blowing. Right. So his brother was a good musician, a school musician, Joe Eldridge. So he said, come on, man, I got to take you and show you. You don't know what the hell you're doing. You know what I mean? Right. So I so you know what Roy told me? He said, yeah, man. He said, I didn't know what no turnaround was. I just knocked the door down and went in. <laughs> That's the funniest thing I ever heard in my life. That's said, a great line. Is that a great line? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, I didn't know what no turnaround was, man. I just knocked the door down and went in. A, a turnaround Turn is when you're playing a song, and there's a part of the song where the chords kind of go around back to the beginning again. Yeah, yeah. So musicians will always talk about the chords at the turnaround. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that's, a, that's a wonderful story. That was, when he told me that, that cra it cracked me up. Now, what about all these, these stories that I've read in interviews with you about... Um, about Coleman Hawkins' superstitions and about, and, and about the way that Roy and Hawk used to kind of play off with each other, whether it was about age or ghosts. Oh, yeah, that's like they definitely were doing that all the time. Could, they talked all the time on the phone all day. Then they'd be working at night. They'd talk like, about cooking and right. clothes and who. So Coleman bought five $500 suits. And at that time, that's a lot of money. Oxford suits. <laughs> <laughs> Oxford clothes, you know. Right. That's a brand, you know, Oxford. Oxford. Roy, he went to the discount stores. Right. You know, they were just the exact opposites. Right. That's why they play so good together. Mm -hmm. So Roy Coleman, he said, Coleman, man, I get four or five suits, man, with what you paid for that. <laughs> Would come, come and say, man, but they don't look good as mine. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's the way they talk to each other all the time, you right, know. Right, right. And but, but they, they was, they was as opposite people as it possibly could be that they played so well together. Wasn't there something about age and? Oh, they were all talking about age. Uh, they were always doing that. That right. was, uh, you know, of course, Coleman was older than Roy. About seven years. At least, yeah, yeah, at least, at least, yeah. Well, Roy just started out so young. Right. You know, that's why they call him Little Jazz. He was a baby when he was out there playing with all these big-time people. Right. You know? Right. Snooky Young told me the greatest story. I'm going to wind down, kind of wind down. Snooky Young told me the funny, you know, Snooky Young's father was a trumpet player. I know that. And, they, and they're, they're from Ohio. Mm -hmm. And this is when Roy used to carry his horn everywhere with him. That's why they call him Little Jazz. So he said, Roy, he, and Snooky used to sit, play with his father, too, mm -hmm. out in Ohio, Youngstown, somewhere like that. He said, so Roy comes in with his little horn on his arm, you know, right. little young guy, yeah, and asks Snooky's father, could he play? And he said, no, boy, you go over there and sit down, you know what I mean? 
So Snooky said, it's a funny thing you ever seen in his life. He said, they stomped off the tune, the band. Roy was sitting over, way over in the corner like that. So he said, he took his horn out when they stomped off the tune. So he just started blowing. And all the people left where the band <laughs> and went over there where he was. No. <laughs> Oh, left from in front of the, 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 the uh, all of them came over there where he was in the corner stomping and playing by himself. Snooky's father said, "Hey, boy, come on up here. You can play with us." <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Well, that's where he. That's who he was. I mean, yeah. I never ever. Coleman was my best musician I ever been around, but I've never been with no one that loved to play their instrument as much as Roy. No one. No one. Mm -hmm. As greatest examples that we went on a cruise one time, <laughs> you know, one of those jazz cruises. But it was a different kind than it was go to Bermuda and back. That's a Jimmy, Jimmy Ryan's band. This was that late, mm -hmm. and he took his wife. Roy had his wife, Vi. Yeah. Well, <coughs> so we get on the cruise. You know, those things you don't really play that much on. Mm -hmm. So we played one time on the way down to Bermuda once. And he's walk, he's walking around like a caged leopard, all over the gym. I said, Roy, they done, they done paid us. I said, what's that? Oh man, we're not playing. We're not playing. No, but them, I guess they don't like me, man. They won't right. let me play. You know, I mean, he was going nuts. Right. I said, man, you got your wife, man, the sunshine, man. You know, right. the fine food, wine. You got everything. He had that horn down in that dressing room. You know what he did? Maybe so. All of a sudden, man, he went to the captain of the ship <laughs> and made him set up a special afternoon <laughs> for him to play. Mm -hmm. And he was just like a little kid that to Santa Claus that came. Mm -hmm. I swear to God, it was just like, and I was so mad at him. <laughs> Everybody in the band was mad at him. <laughs> and he was so happy. He says, got all dressed up, man, and put his, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I was dumbfounded. I couldn't believe it. I said, this guy's got his wife and everybody's here and there's all this beautiful stuff, food, everything. But he couldn't, he couldn't, he could not be there with that horn and not play it. Now, it's a, it's a painful subject, or not painful, but it's a, it's, it's a sad part of, of reality. Um, Coleman Hawkins' last years. Yeah. And to the degree that you'd like to, 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 to put it on the record, what, what happened to Coleman Hawkins? I don't know. I wish if I knew that. I've asked him a million times, and I was nobody closer to him than me. And I have no idea. Well, he knew what he was doing. He was a very brilliant man. It wasn't about money, because he had money. <laughs> you know? But why he did what he did to himself, committed suicide with alcohol, I don't know. Mm -hmm. That's what he did. Mm -hmm. Just slowly, very yeah. slowly. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, Rome was talking about Thelonious Monk before. And Monk, know, he loved Monk. And I know that you were around Monk and Coleman Hawkins. Coleman Hawkins and Monk. Monk loved Coleman Hawkins. I tell you what, Coleman, I never, these people talk about somebody, when, Col when Monk was around Coleman Hawkins, he was a completely different person than the persona that people saw otherwise. You know, huh? he, he loved him so much, you know what I mean? Because Coleman helped him get started, like he did a lot of those young guys of that period. He would ask him, you like my shoes? You like my coat? Like my clothes, you know, and he, and he was always be dressed up, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, in that collection that I Columbia bought, that I my, my pictures, it's a picture of him and <laughs> what it was Coleman's birthday. That's after he had grew the beard. This was near the end, couple years. Really. So what I did, I went to the, <laughs> I went to the cake shop, mm -hmm. and I had a cake made. And I had the Beatle figurines put on the top of it. <laughs> and there's a picture of Monk and Coleman sitting in front of, behind this cake with that cake, with the Beatle figurines. <laughs> and so Coleman said, man, why did you do that? I said, you look like the Beatles. <laughs> it was. It was so funny, man. It's a, it's a picture of it, you know, right, in that, the right. Columbia. That, that, yeah, yeah. Right. But I'd have fun with him like that, you know. Mm -hmm. So you were in a long line, line of musicians, I guess, going back to Th Thelonious Monk and earlier, uh, people that they saw something in 
and kind of brought along in a certain way. Oh, yeah, Coleman and all those guys, you know, all of those musicians loved him because, I mean, I wasn't there when he did it, but I could just tell from them being around him mm -hmm. that he helped them so much emotionally with their music right. and cared about them so much that they idolized him. Monk I I idolized Coleman, mm -hmm. you know. So what was it like? So we're, we're talking about this great quartet that you're in with Coleman Hawkins and, and with Roy, but that, that Hawkins Quartet made all those great records. Now, this is the same time. You're also recording for the same label that John Coltrane's quartet that's is right. recording for. You're both recording for Impulse right. with the same producer, Bob Thiel. That was, yeah, right. that's right. So, you know, what was, were the younger cats with Sonny Rollins and Coleman Hawk and, and, Co and, and, and Coltrane and all those people? Um, they was always around Coleman. Coltrane and Sonny Rollins. Well, you know they had that, you know I got that letter, I sent it up to Manhattan School of Music. What letter? This Sonny Rollins wrote Coleman. No. You've never seen it? No. I'll live it to you, you can put it here. It's like three pages. It'll almost bring tears to your eyes. This was like in 1960, it was after Sonny was made already, you know, it was big. Mm -hmm. And he wrote this letter to how much he had admired him from the time and what made him be able to do what he did by knowing him. It's the most beautiful letter. Can we get a copy? Yeah. Okay, we'd love to see that. And and Coltrane wrote the same kind of letter, but it was five pages. <laughs> I course. swear, but I but I, I but I didn't uh, right. but I they, I didn't get it because I did, we couldn't go up to the house after he died. I couldn't go up there. Mm -hmm. It was a, such a mess. And um, but they told me I could come up there and get anything I wanted. But his family told me that, but I couldn't go up there. Mm -hmm. You know. And uh, but it was the same kind of letter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because he took up time with them, mm -hmm. you know, and Sonny Rollins used to call him up, say, "What do you need anything?" And they would send him a big baskets of fruit and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I would tell these young guys, I said, "Man, that's why those guys were such great musicians too. Mm -hmm. The compassion of them playing was in their soul of what they were. You know, you can't be this one thing here and that, that, and you you get on the bandstand, you think it's gonna, oh, it, it, it don't happen like that, you know." Didn't Joe Jones used to have a somewhere we used to say like you know you play what you are or something like that? Something sure. He said things like that. Yeah. So you knew all these all these wonderful folks and, and these philosophers and somebody stuff. just asked me about Wood of the Lion. Some guy back there. He was right. so yeah. I played with the lion too. Yeah. What was he like, Eddie? Great. <laughs> he was great. I played with just him and I. Right. And he would say, when the first time I played with him was at a place called, a place called Gulliver's used to be out in... New oh, Jersey. Yeah, the oh. little Gulliver's in West Patterson it was On Squir in. Squirrelwood Road. Road. That's right. right. And first time I played with him, when I came off the band, he said, you got a nice foot there, boy. He said, you're going to be a good drummer one of these days. He said, you got, he said, you got a good foot. You got a good foot. <laughs> yeah. He was a good man. He was good. He was something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, you know what's just so fascinating. You know, we're just ca you're casually telling us stories about these people, and as I think about it, I mean, you're really talking about being in touch with the people who created the music. I know, I know. That's what I said. I was lucky. You know, I was lucky being lucky and good. Because I've always wondered about that. When Coleman Hawkins was young, there was no Coleman Hawkins. That's right. Absolutely. And that's a shocking thing. I mean, he had no saxophone records to listen to. No. <laughs> that's right. And the Lion had nobody to imitate, and yet, and you had to play with all these people. In later years. Um, you spent so many years at Ryan's, of course, and at other places. And um, a record came out, which I urge you all to get it if you can. A record came out a couple of years ago of a concert. I mean, I attended as a listener, but it was called Eddie Locke and Friends. Yeah. And, I mean, every note on that record should be like etched in stone or something. It's, I mean, all these great musicians, but, you know, it's like almost like a, a jackpot when all the things come up. It just seems like everything came up on that particular Well, that was gig. the funniest thing in the world. And I, I tell all these young musicians yeah. that they that's really don't know what's going on. I, I, when that was, that, that, that made that for the American Field Service, the foreign exchange people they had. I, that's, I do, you know, I like kids. So I, I was always on some place where there's children or young people. And they had this concert. They wanted to record this concert. We have a concert, you can record it and use it as a fundraiser. And they said, okay. So now I went to these guys, and I'm here, this little old me, man. I went to Vic Dickerson and asked him, would he, uh, would he come and play? Yeah, what time we want to bet it, but they didn't say, he didn't say, how much money you gonna pay me? I went to Bud Johnson, same thing. I went to Roy, he gave me a little flack. Well, you ain't no leader, you know that, but I'm okay. I said, I'll come. But the other thing he said, 
he had never played in a church before. Mm. Now he was really old fashioned. He said, man, I don't know about playing in a church, man. <laughs> that was the first time, really. Yeah. Uh -huh. He had never, he said, I don't know about playing. Now, now, now these people had something, you know, their, their upbringing, because I knew his father, Roy's father. Tell me about him. Huh? He Tell was a nice man. He could make the best coleslaw you ever <laughs> had in your life. What, was he with the Pittsburgh? Size? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I went to the house in Pittsburgh with mm -hmm. Roy. Mm -hmm. He was still alive when I was playing with Roy. Was his dad a musician? or No. Uh -huh. No. Jesus. Yeah. No. So who else was in the band at the church? It was it was Roy, Bud Johnson, and Vic Dickerson. I mean, what kind of front line was that, right? And, and this was Tommy Franklin, the first time he played after his first heart attack. And I said, well, man, would you come and do this because you won't have, with all those horns, you won't have to play that much, you know what I mean? You know, you could, you could, right. you wouldn't have to be worried about him playing long solos or nothing, you know? So for him, the first time to come back after this heart attack, the first one. That was a long time ago when he had his first one. A lot of people don't realize how long ago it was when he had his first yeah. one. And Major Holly was... And Major Holly was the bass player. So it was a... And I was scared to death. And Joe Jones was there. This is another funny line. The first time I ever this in my life. Joe Jones was there. This was in St. Peter's Church. I don't know if any have been to St. Peter's Church. When you come down the steps, they got this big area where a lot of people can sit and all that. And then they got the, the pew out front where the people sat. So we were out there playing, and Joe was sitting back there, mm -hmm. back there. So somebody came back there at the first, when the intermission, they came up there and says, Joe, man, why are you sitting back here, man? Why come you not out there? He said, I can hear them, and I know what they look like. <laughs> <laughs> That's a wonderful album. Is that, yeah, that's a wonderful album. Vic Dickerson, the, the, the my choice that he plays that um, that song, Manhattan. Da 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 da. Yeah. Da 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 da. Yeah yeah yeah. Ooh yeah. man, <laughs> <It's> beautiful. <laughs> you know he was just uh, a poet. Yeah yeah. Poet. Yeah. And the other part about it that I, that why young musicians listen to records like that. Every one of those persons played their own thing. It was like a copycat. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They had their own individual souls in it. You know, so they wouldn't get boring. You know, because when you go to hear some of these groups and one solos get through playing, when another one starts, you might as well just left because he plays just like the same thing another one was playing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the stories was not there. That's you know? very true. That's it very is. True. It's. Yeah. It's just amazing. Yeah. Now, this is a point in the interviews where usually we open it up to the audience for comments and or sure questions. questions or anything like that. And I know right, right over here, my, our old friend Bert Westbridge just wanted to remind you of, a, of something that he attended once. Yeah. Oh, I guess it was maybe 15, 20 years ago. I heard of you sort of pulled the trick on Roy and uh, you told him you had a gig and you'd appreciate if, he, if you would help him out a little. And it was actually a surprise party Birthday for party, him. yeah, up in, the, up in the Westchester, yeah. Right. Yeah, it was. He was mad at me. Because <laughs> he, I told him I had this job, so when he, when he, as he, we, were, we were driving, he said, well, man, what kind of job is it? What, 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 what kind of gig is it? I said, well, man, I said, it's something like a bar mitzvah. Oh, oh, he said, oh, my God, man. You got, you got me out of my house, man, all of that this afternoon, man. I'm not, what are you, what's the matter with you? Are you crazy? I said, oh, man, I do want you to do I just wanted you to do the job with me. You know, I had to do something to keep him off balance, you know. <laughs> but he... Uh, but but he came. That's that's the other part. That's what I'm saying. And he, These guys he was were so surprised. Too. Oh, he was he surprised. He, he was surprised. People. Yeah. And they yeah. start singing. I think it was Happy Birthday. Oh yeah, it was his birthday. Yeah. Yeah. Comments, questions. Anybody want to ask something? Yeah, I just I talked to you an intermission. Could you tell me something about Wilson Driver? Wilson Driver. Oh, Joe's teacher. Yeah, it was a, he was quite a guy. He missed the driver. Mess with Mr. That's what I call him, Max Roach. We all call him Mr. Driver, because that's what Joe, Joe Jones called him, Mr. Driver. He was one that taught Joe Jones how to play the drums, and he taught a lot of musicians, Haywood Henry, and 
Uh, he was from Birmingham, you know, down there. And he was the, the leading musician. And he taught him. He was quite a guy. And his daughter was Sonia Sanchez, a famous black woman that were taught. She was head of the English department at Temple University. I think she's probably retired now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but she, she's a poet. And she, and, uh, oh, I know she still does that. And she's and she, yeah, right. yeah, she yeah. an activist, activist. She's a very activist, yeah. very active person. And Mr. Driver lived to be like 90. He was born in a leap year. So and I went to his 95th birthday. At the West End? Was that the well, he lived right up there at the 20, Lennox Terrace. 20, yeah, 20. It, yeah, that there at Lennox, that Lennox Terrace. And he, so he was telling everybody, he was a cantankerous guy, you know, little bitty guy, you know. So I told Joe Jones, I said, now nah, I know why you got like you got, because he was <laughs> this guy here, you know. Because right. <laughs> he said, he used to play in the play for the silent movies, Mr. Driver in the South, you know. So after Joe got, you know, a little older, you know, Joe, he said, I came, to, Joe came by to see him playing in the theater and he's playing. The, the, uh, the, and so he asked Joe, did he want, did he want to play something? Joe said, no, because you ain't playing nothing anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Driver said he was smart like a smart like that when he was young, you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he's uh, he's uh, Mr. Driver was quite a man. He was a different kind of guy, you know. He's he 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 was with Chuck full of nuts. He wouldn't play anymore because he wanted to raise his children. So he was with Chuck full of nuts. Which when the Chuck full of nuts gave the employees a great life, gave them part of the company. You know, mm -hmm. they all made a good living. All of those employees, one of the few companies ever did that. The chocolate nuts used to have the annual picnic for the employees, and every year, you know, Jackie Robinson was always there. They'd have a baseball game, and Jackie Robinson would come out. Well, that was one of the few little companies like that that did really help the employees. All those people had money when they when they got older. Do you remember that chocolate nuts at 50th and Broadway? Yeah, where all where all the musicians hung out. There was a chocolate nuts on that corner when I came to town, even at, even at that point. Yeah, yeah. It used to be right there on 116th and Broadway, right across from Columbia, right yeah. there on the corner. Yeah. But anyway, but Mr. Driver was quite a, he was quite a character, you know. He was, um, he, uh, evidently he must have known a lot about music at the time when he came along, and for that period. Mm -hmm. Because all those people, you know, that they admired him so much. Well, you know, what's so interesting about that is the point that those early people, the people who taught Joe Jones, you know, they all read music and they all played music and they did all those things. And there's all these, um, <clears throat> the feeling that in the old days of the music that the people who came up somehow were just kind of like, you know, inventing the wheel or something. And for the most part, the great majority of them, but it's just so it's funny you mentioned the bar mitzvah because you and I played together at, I guess, Roy's last... That was his last gig. That was that. The last for, time he ever came out of the house. For Dan Morgenstern, was his son. Yeah. It was Dan Morgenstern, who's a great jazz writer and friend of Roy's. Yeah. Oh yeah. And it was his son's bar mitzvah. Bar mitzvah. So, yeah. At the tavern and, on the green. You, me, and the uh, and the. Uh, What's Keith the Ingham. Keith Ingham. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And Roy came out and sang. Sang. Yeah. And that was about it. That was it. That was the last time he performed. Yeah. 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 Uh, what year was that? Eighty. Eighty-nine. <coughs> so, so Eddie, what's the, what are your takes on the, on the jazz world, on the scene, on the things that you've seen happen, and, and on top it's of that, sad. it's sad, it's well, sad, and, and on top of that, I'll just throw one last question in because it's getting late. Yes, it is and, getting late. And the other question, <laughs> and the other part of the question is about the things that you may not know about him, which are the humanitarian things. And the things that Eddie's done with children over the years, and the, and the, can I say even tough love kind of way that you have, um, uh, somehow just take all that and, and talk about it somehow. Well, I always like young people. I still do. You know, that's what. Uh, every time I see Mike Ladon or John Gordon or, or Bill Sharlap, but Bill Sharlap, we played in school when he was like a little bitty boy, mm. and with uh, Roland Hannah, myself, and. Um, Major Holly, he said he went home and told his mother, I want to be a jazz musician. He said, I had never heard no music like that before in my life. And so now they imitate me. And so Mike, Mike LaDonna said that he, he had talked to uh, 
Bill Sharlop and else. So he said, "You saw Locke today?" So yeah. He said, "What sermon did you hear?" <laughs> <laughs> but they're all my babies, man. Right. What are you really? What are your thoughts about the jazz world in 2006, 2007? Well, this, I think the jazz was a reflection of all of our times. You know, the times of people aren't nice like they used to be, man. People don't want to be nice for some reason. I don't know what happened. But it's not, the people don't share themselves like people used to share. And that was in the jazz. That's what was part of the jazz. It's the jazz is not isolated away from everything else. Right. It's part of the whole community, the, all the nutty stuff. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And people caring about each other. That's what, that's, that's, that was a fine example of that quartet when that guy, that's what he reminded me of when he wanted me to sign it, that he brought that record. That was just about us caring about each other. Mm -hmm. Somebody said, well, it can't be that something. I said, well, that's, that's what it was. That's what it was. It was, you know, that made the music what it was. Yeah. Well, I'd like to say thank you for having made tonight a night that maybe we never played in the band with Coleman Hawkins, but I think all, all of us feel almost as though we were in a band with you for a night and we got to find out all about you. And all I can say is on behalf of the Jazz Museum in Harlem, thank you very, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.